It is. Yeah. Um, so I think Frankie is with us as well. We've got a, it's great to see so many people. Um, 129 on my, on my counter down here. Um, Frankie, perhaps you could just sort of reveal yourself in the darkness. Um, Hello. Well, Hello. Cool. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here. I am here. <laughs> and I've oh, unmuted well, myself. <laughs> the, um, it, it reminds me of the quote of, of Meister Eckhart, which may, may come up in conversation shortly <laughs> about uh, God who uh, reveals uh, God's self in the darkness. And I think we'll we'll, talk a well bit Paul, we're, that. we're all hidden Christ after all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some of us are more hidden than others. Um, so, this is a very strange time, isn't it? I think um, we've had, uh, this, this last few months has been a time when we've had to undo uh, a lot of our assumptions about what it means to be uh, a human being, what it means to be in this civilization that we're in. So, uh, what Frankie and I will be talking about um, is some work that both of us are doing, actually, but I'm desperate to hear, uh, <laughs> get some more of Frankie's wisdom uh, about um, the kind of unknowing, the de-knowing, if you like, that, that climate change uh, and the ecological emergency is doing to us and perhaps needs to do to us because uh, it's only going to be that kind of um, courageous step into the unknown that's going to reveal the future that we really need and can draw on the resources uh, that we really need. So I think, shall we, shall we kick off? It's nearly 10.30 and um, let me just introduce uh, the theme of our conversation today. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, this is all about reimagining the promised land. And I think in this session, the emphasis is on the re, uh, the shortest, um, um, prefix, uh, shortest pair of letters than any uh, uh, in the whole title. But uh, this is about rethinking really what, how we do imagination in this time of when everything seems to be collapsing, the, the, the uh, uncertainties that we have around us, surging around us about, you know, has the economic system that we've got caused the crisis that we're in? Uh, what lies behind it? Many of you uh, would have seen that cartoon of the, the stages of kind of tsunamis that are heading our way. So, and COVID-19 is the little one at the front. And then you've got all the, the, the ecological emergency behind it just waiting to break. Um, so we're going to draw on this spirituality of unknowing that uh, Meister Eckhart and, um, and even Zoom introduces us to. And uh, we're going to explore what that... Um, promised land is that even now we find difficult to imagine the lies beneath our feet. So hello to Frankie and I want to introduce everybody to Frankie's book and just to prove that I've read it here it is and it's well done. <laughs> uh, like there's no tomorrow uh, published by Sacristy Press and uh, it's a good read it's 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 an exciting um, but quite a challenging read as well. Uh, Frankie is a um, She's been many things. Uh, she calls herself a writer and researcher, a preacher, speaker, teacher. Uh, she's been Dean of St. Edmundsbury Cathedral in Suffolk and moved from there a couple of years ago to live now in West Cumbria in Workington, where she's a half-time priest uh, in charge of two churches. And, and frankly, at one time, you called yourself a freelance theologian, which sounds quite fun. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I quite fancy that. Does it pay well? Uh, well, not as I mean, certainly not enough to live on. And actually, I prefer prefer the term Paul. I prefer the term amateur theologian because, you know, theology has been a love of my life ever since university. And working or trying to discern, you know, and and study and go into the rich resources of our Christian traditions, and and be a theologian is really simply to seek what God is doing in today's world and how how we can understand that in, in all its depth and breadth. So. And, and to love doing that, you know, so the, the word amateur and its original meaning of, of doing things, money, but, but actually doing things for love and for its own sake. I, I, I guess that's where I am now. Yeah, yeah. And, and we met through, um, through the Borrowed Time project, which was through yeah. Green Christian is 
uh, and helping, trying to help people develop, uh, draw on the energies of their emotional response to um, the climate and ecological crisis. And uh, and one of the challenges and um, joys of that really is just is is exactly as you say, you know, drawing deeply on on the love of theology and and really doing some public work with that, making it available to to the general, to the wider public, not people of faith necessarily. Um, and uh, you're coming to lead our retreat next year in October. Eight and Very eight much eight looking forward to it. That's right. It's in yeah, the well, so Looking forward to it. It'd be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So please, um, everyone else, please do <laughs> mark back in your diary and you'll get a taster of that. Um, but uh, every time I see Frankie, she's got some new material. So this is not, um, <laughs> you won't, don't think that you will have seen it because there's, there's some, there's some, She's working at pace, I can tell you. Uh, that'll be at Ringsfield Hall, it's a place that many of us have already visited and um, and has had some happy news about its future recently. So it's uh, great to be able to get back there. Um, I think, uh, I don't think there's any more housekeeping that I need to do, but maybe if anybody wants to, on the team wants to interrupt me just now, they're welcome to. Um, but I'll outline the, uh, program of what we're going to do over the next hour and a half. Uh, I'll just give a bit more introduction to the kind of terrain that we'll be exploring, Frankie and me. Um, it's quite used to term actually for Frankie's book because it's quite a kind of travelogue in a way. I won't, I won't sort of spoil the, um, I won't give a spoiler there, but it, uh, it's, it's sort of framed around a journey from now in a narrow boat from one end of the country to the other, a uh, really useful device. Um, so a little introduction from me. Uh, and then uh, we'll just explore some of the, the things that were uh, in Frankie's mind at the time that she wrote the book and really come through as themes um, and, and perhaps where, where, you're, where you're taking that now, Frank, as well. You know, mm. uh, say the new stuff coming out all the time here. Uh, we will then have uh, hopefully 25 minutes in breakout groups, uh, about four, uh, uh, four or five each. Um, and we'll explore, this will be an opportunity just for you, for everybody to take forward these questions that we'll be exploring about what hope actually means for you now, uh, for any of us, for all of us, for us as a society. What, what, what is its meaning now, both theologically, politically, practically? Um, and also a, a, a really um, cogent, a, a salient theme uh, that seems to be coming through a lot of work that's been done around this uh, in the theology particularly is the question of lament how do we lament what how do we do that not just that recognizing that we need to but actually where do we find the skills for that in a society that has lost them uh, so we'll come back and you, you, what we invite you to do is to share your thoughts and questions in the chat and uh, for the time that we've got remaining Frankie and I'll uh, see what we can make of, of them and to help you and how you can help us in the last quarter of an hour or so. Um, so here we are in uh, 2020, you know, this was the year that we fixed everything. COP26, uh, the Biodiversity Summit, uh, you know, time scales getting increasingly short, increasingly um, compressed in order to be able to take action, uh, increasing unease that we may not actually do what we think we need to do. Um, I was very struck by uh, Bishop James Jones's um, quite a hard hitting introduction last evening. If, if you saw that, uh, where he talked about, he said that we were not now earthing heaven, which was the um, the mission of the Christian, of the, of the believer, but, but earthing hell. Uh, and, you know, the, the kind of projections that are heading our way if we don't take the action that we were all talking about, wanting to take yesterday, um, are pretty sobering. Uh, and what I took from your work, Frank, is that you, you were not prepared to look away from those. And, I, and that really helped me because um, I think a lot of people go through a process of of actually yeah. wanting to face up to um, these potentialities and, and yet not knowing how to do it and not having people to do it with. Uh, the source that I've turned to uh, as well 
to help with this is, is um, the whole area of climate psychology. Uh, and there's a psychologist called Rene Lertzman who says the more we can openly acknowledge how we're feeling about what's going on, the more we can quickly free up a lot of that energy to be strategic and creative, all the capacities we're needing to unleash right now. Uh, and this is exactly what you see with Extinction Rebellion and such like. Um, so I'm curious, frankly, you know, what, what was it that um, uh, got you into this space? Uh, I mean, this is a tricky, there's always a hard question to answer. So I'm just going to, I'm going to answer it for myself first and then uh, uh, see, see how you, um, how it was for you. Um, for me, this all happened in 2018. Um, this was a year of the IPCC 1.5 degrees report, uh, which, you know, really brought home how short the time is that we've been in the ground. Uh, it was the Easter Extinction Rebellion rising. Uh, I think significantly, that's the year that I lost my father as well, I think that there was a sense that bereavement was in the air, that loss was an experience that I was beginning to open to. And I, I read uh, the deep adaptation paper by Professor Jem Bendel, which uh, has made quite a lot of waves uh, in many circles, but not yet, I think, in Christian, in the church. Um, and it was a sort of roller coaster, but in the end, it was a bit like a dam bursting and a kind of sense of liberation. And I, I, but I wonder how that was for you. You know, what, what was that pro? transition for you how that work? yeah well i think like like you paul it's it, a gradual thing i mean i think back to prior to the 2008 crash a real sense of an un, unarticulated sense that things couldn't go on as they were that sense of optimistic progress and growth mm -hmm. and i've never been a fan of you know that neoliberalism and the the economic theories of hayek and you know had such a profound effect on the monetarism of Thatcher and Reagan, you know, it just didn't feel like it was going to hold forever. And, and with the way in which it commodified everything as well, you know, nature included. And, and now, you know, and there's lots of work to be done, I think, on how our attention is becoming commodified, you know, into predictive products with the work of um, Shoshana Zub Zuboff. That's her really, really important book, Surveillance Capitalism. So progress and growth, not good metaphors. And I had that sort of sense for quite a while that this is this is not right you know not good aspirations um as as, as indeed you've said you know it's explored quite a lot yesterday evening which was good and then when i read jen bendel you know his his that that paper deep adaptation which went viral um and is still deeply influential um on, on um on a lot of people he seemed to articulate the sort of analysis that i was looking for a real wake-up call and then the urgency of Greta Thunberg, of course, and, and, you know, her sort of sense of this can't go on and this is not, this is not my, the, my future, you know, and I'm not, you know, uh, you're responsible, uh, wonderful when she stood up, you know, the UN, oh, fantastic stuff. And so a sense of really coming alive personally to uh, the terrible urgency of what's before us um, and how we should respond. And I was in... Uh, a high pressure job. I was dean of a cathedral and, and believe me, that's that's a high pressure job. Well, I certainly found it to be, you know, and I had this a real sense of anxiety all the time, which was like, which is to do with the job. But also there are underlying things going on, a bit like you were saying, you know, loss was was the sort of atmosphere you were living in. Well, anxiety was the atmosphere I was living in. And I just um, felt that I had to stop back and stop, step back and, and go and go deep and try and work out um, what I could do personally. And so that narrow boat trip turned into a sort of slow journey of going, of going much more deeply into what my life's about and into the natural world around, because of course our canals are, you know, wonderful uh, corridors of wildlife and a re-engagement with, with, with nature, which I've always loved. I mean, I was a tree climber as, as a youngster and, you know, loved bird life and you know it's, it's a very natural love of mine so um so that's what the book is really it's it's written with style and hopefully a sense of accessibility that can enable other people to go on a journey into their own um really quite difficult terrain of 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 lament grief and to transfer that transform that 
um, negative awfulness into hope. And, you know, I really want us to end with a fierce hope for reimagining how life can be and, 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 and an activism that's ground in, grounded into a sort of contemplation that, that does go deep and, and strong into yeah. our, um, Christian past. Yeah. Yes, I mean, so you, you, you certainly, it's, um, you take people quite deep into it in a very kind of gentle way, uh, you know, surrounded by the banks of the canal, and uh, mm. it's a lovely environment they create. But actually, you know, the very first thing you talk about in the book is, is about deep adaptation. And I think, mm. uh, so, you know, you're not pulling any punches there. Mm -mm. Uh, let's, I mean, it might just help to outline what, what the, the, the bones of that sort of mm. um, narrative, if you like, Future, because mm. that's what it is. He, he, he calls it Jembe Never Kills It, um, a map for navigating ecological tragedy. Mm. And uh, it, he, 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 he's, his premise is that, that we're heading for a collapse uh, ecologically, socially, and, and uh, that out of, uh, or in response to that, there, there, there are four principles that he advocates resilience, restoration, relinquishment and reconciliation and these are all I mean, he's not a um he's not a christian he's not a he's probably a bit more of a buddhist he wouldn't say these anything actually i don't think but um these are all themes of faith aren't they these are all real yeah. um these are real <laughs> kind of yeah. you know they you really you, are real <laughs> yes you will have preached all of this stuff in st edinburgh cathedral and you still do no doubt um so just give us a little sense of what what that um what deep adaptation meant for you and, and, yeah. and how it's kind of steered your, or guided your, your thinking, how that's developed. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that all the great faiths of the world will be, you know, the same themes will recur again and again. And I do think um, Bendel's put his, his finger on, and those four R's are, are, are really, really profound. They're good, you know, resilience. We need to be resilient into the future. Um, we need to restore what needs to be restored. We need to relinquish. And we'll talk perhaps a little bit more about that because I think our lifestyles, as someone suggested last night, really do need to have a good look at them. You know, we do waste so much, for heaven's sake. You know, and reconciliation. And again, let's come back to that because where is that reconciliation? And, and to my mind, it has to be where God is reconciling the, the whole universe with itself. And, and partly my thinking at the moment about entanglement is about that. Um, so, but I think really what Bendel did for me was, was a real sense of, of reality. There's another R for you, you know, or at least the will to contemplate a worst case scenario and reframe, reframe life accordingly. If it doesn't happen and let's hope to goodness it doesn't, then, then well and good. But if we're facing into catastrophe, then we need to think deeply about how we live like there's no tomorrow. Um, we do need to change radically, I believe, and that happens when we embrace a different set of priorities. And relinquishment, as I've just said, it's a crucial part of that, being able to accept less, to realise that material goods and that neoliberal ideology that shapes all our desires increasingly through clickbait and all, all sorts, that's not what makes us fully human. Um, and I think this is here where um, Pope Francis's Laudato Si, which is such a good encyclical, has important things to say. When humanity commodifies everything, particularly the natural world, we simply destroy so much beauty, diversity, a sense of connection and participation in the natural world. And I know someone called Charles Croydon, who's watching, you know, is really interested in, 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 in that encyclical. Mm. It's very quickly becoming clear, I think, that it simply isn't worth it it isn't worth it and so what do we value what is of worth to us and again all the great religions of the world ask that question and all of them arrive at very um different answers to the neoliberal ideologies that's so dominant with in western societies today and so i think it's important that christians don't just remain with the anxiety and the lament but find ways of making a difference depending on our circumstances which will be very different we can't just go you know, into a holy huddle of lament without turning it into positive action. The lament is a step on the way to, you know, hope and a joy. And that was why the worship was so good this, this morning. Really, we need to be holding on to the sense of joy and praise in order to really 
um, inform and undergird our life, lifestyle changes, which we have to make, and our protesting and our positive action and our lobbying. Our, our action and political engagement needs to hold its anchor into contemplation, into a sense that God holds us to another vision, one that isn't ultimately materialistic or driven by consumerism as the markets of the world would have us be. So I think, I think that's, that's how I respond to Jen Bender. And I do think he's, he's saying some really interesting, interesting things. Yeah. And it's interesting that you introduced that concept. Well, it's not just a concept, it's a, it's a gateway uh, into political action of, of contemplation. And uh, in my kind of Uh, um, I don't know if others are finding Paul is breaking up a bit here. Would it be worth bring uh, samples the spirit that you, how are we doing now? Are we yeah uh, we're back on yeah, track. we're back you're back you're back with us. <laughs> uh, well, well, excuse me, while we have a, a little break, um uh, Frankie, your your screen is bouncing a lot. So I wonder if you're all oh, right is on something that isn't stable. It's probably because I'm a little bit anxious and jiggling my legs underneath the <laughs> There we go. Stop doing that. It's an old habit of mine. <laughs> I will stop doing it, but that's what it is, I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, that's a, well I, I was just talking about contemplation, so a little bit of calm. Let's get let this sort of yes, stuff. Yes, um, calm. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the, in the contemplative tradition, I think one of the, the mo things that's most unfamiliar to people now and precisely for all the reasons that you've said is um is this idea of dispossession uh, this this whole uh, giving up that's necessary that that, 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 that the desert pioneers back in the you know early church talked about john of the cross the cloud of unknowing and you you, you draw on the cloud of unknowing quite a bit in mm. uh, you're obviously quite a fan of it so tell us a bit well, why do you feel that was why do you feel that's such an important um, place to be in, in our activism? Can, can I come to that, Paul, um, through another word that, that really takes me into the cloud of unknowing um, in a way that I think brings it right into the present times and, 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 and contemporary thinking, particularly around entanglement. Can I, can I just talk a little bit about yeah, it? Yeah, go, go ahead, yeah. Because, I mean, it's a word used to describe the fate of an increasing number of minke and humpbacked whales and porpoises and dolphins that now swim the coasts of the UK as, as, our, as our oceans warm up. And these giant ocean creatures have all been found snared in fishing gear in recent years. I think it's called ghost gear, isn't it, these days? Tangled up and dying in nets and lines that kill. And so, you know, I first saw it then and then I mean, it is a word of metaphorical power, it seems, to capture that hopeless and helpless state of political and economic structures and systems which fail to address the climate chaos of extreme storm and flood and fire and trees, disease and plastic everywhere that we live with and think, what can I do about this? So we feel entangled, I think. And how do we kept cope with that sense of being entangled in distress and deep grief that God's creation is so threatened? And an obvious reaction is turned from those micro questions to micromanage, macro questions to micromanagement. And so we become entangled in minutiae, trivial concerns, left hemisphere processes and procedures with a real sense that our hands, soul, mind, soul, heart and strength are tied. But entanglement goes in other directions which are more positive. And, um, and, and I go back to the 1930s and Erwin Schrodinger, who described a strange phenomenon, noticing that particles, when connected, become matter, and the connections maintained with each particle mirroring the other exactly and instantaneously. Schrodinger coined the term entanglement, as he wrote to Einstein. And Andrew Briggs and his colleagues, who are Oxford quantum physicists, describe it thus. And this is where we start to go into the cloud. Each atom has a hard nugget at its centre, the nucleus, and flying or swirling or vibrating around this nucleus is a cloud or vibrance of electrons. We say cloud because each electron does not orbit the nucleus like a planet orbiting the sun, they write, but rather enfolds the nucleus all at once like a souffle around a grain of sugar. We say vibrance because this cloud is not vague but precisely tuned 
exhibiting the most precise vibrations in nature and causing a kind of superconduction of electrical current around each nucleus. So Andrew Briggs writes. So in, they're using entanglement increasingly to describe a universe that's ultimately mysterious with particles echoing, resonating with others in myriad relation, a metaphor of participation in space and time. And again, he says that quantum physics, quantum entanglement offers us another metaphor that illustrates some of the themes that Trinitarian theology affirms. This is where it gets really exciting to my mind. In a three-part quantum entangled state, he says, there are three physical entities that contribute some of their properties independently, but which also exhibit an inseparable nature, such that some properties of the whole cannot be assigned individually to the parts, but exhibit purely a correlation or mutuality between the parts. And this is really exciting to my mind, because it seems to suggest that at the basis of all that there is, is connection and a vibrancy. And the Trinitarian God, it seems, can be understood like this in ways an analogous to how particles exist in entangled relation. God incarnate as Jesus Christ, moving as Holy Spirit to draw order from chaos, where all creation comes together in a deep harmony within time and space, in which God intimately creates, universally loves, entangling humanity within the world around. So then if we come to the cloud of unknowing um, and think about entanglement as a souffle or a cloud, the 14th century spiritual classic of apophatic theology, which means, you know, as you've said, you know, it's going into the unknown, into, the, into what we, we can't, what we, we, what we don't know. And the cloud of unknowing was written in times neither peaceful nor contemplative, when war waged in England, Scotland, across Europe, when the church was in captivity and schism, plague raged uncontrollably. Does that sound familiar? And the author describes entering the cloud, the divine dark, he calls it, where the person seeks to be united with God beyond reason in ways inexpressible by language. And to be known by God within this cloud is to live entangled in hope, love, lament, where there's always more to know and not know in deep connection with that generative power of the natural world, community and God. And so he, he writes, and therefore shape thee to bide in this darkness as long as thou mayest, evermore crying after him whom thou lovest. For if ever thou shalt see him or feel him, as it may be here, it must always be in this cloud and in this darkness. And if thou wilt busily travail as I bid thee, I trust in his mercy that thou shalt come thereto. So I think it's a really profound work that encourages us to abide there in the darkness of uncertainty, anxiety, and not try to escape like Aaron, uh, Elon Musk of up to Mars, <laughs> how God's grace to find us there, because God's grace is there. And the cloud of God's grace reminds us we're entangled in creation, in the world around other people, nations. And to realize this, to live and participate differently, I think, tuning our lives to the deep song of God's creation offering us rich grounds, I think, for contemplation to inspire and sustain the necessary activism we need to change the consumer habits of our generation. To participate in the cloud is to resist the market forces that commodify our lives. It is to journey from the intense pain of despair through lament to a fierce hope that seeks to discern the grace of God in the darkness and the cloud of current times. It is to lament the passing of taking mm -hmm granted normalities and to find the hope to live this moment as richly as possible like there's no tomorrow <laughs> so yes i mean I, that that's a that's a piece that i've actually just written for the church times and you know it's it's published you can find it on the church website church times website but you know it, it does seem to summarize i think why it's important to turn back to the classics of our christian tradition where we can find real riches to help us to understand emotionally um, and theologically you know, some of the challenges and, and to find ways to, to respond to them that make us keep us and make us as fully human as possible. Yeah, and I can see that love of theology that you're talking about coming through. And it, 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 I think what, what I'm hearing there is just this sense that really theology has something to offer publicly. Um, and it reminds me of you know, the, the, the title of Jen Bendel's paper is absolutely navigating ecological tragedy and, and yeah. 
Yeah, if, if, if the church could be the people who, on, or a people on behalf of society, who begin to tell stories of the future like that, um, then I think we're going to be in a much better place. Um, and certainly, your, you know, the idea of the Trinity actually reminds me of this theory that the Trinity is constantly pouring itself out one to another. Um, and, and that itself is, is this sort of, you know, giving themselves up. God constantly giving, giving himself up uh, within the person of the Trinity, if you like. And that seems to be a kind of, I don't know, some kind of model of where we need to be yeah. uh, these days. Yeah, so you, you talked about, um, you, you brought together two, two kind of um, movements in, uh, in the human spirit, which you know, are, are often difficult to think of together, hope and lament. And, and I just wonder if we'll take, let's just take a couple of minutes before we go into breakout rooms, because these are, um, these are the things that we'll be inviting people to sort of um, ponder. Um, so what, what does hope mean for, for you now, Frankie? What does it actually mean? Does it, does it have a meaning? Yeah, yeah. It, it does. Oh, it does. I, I think when we stop, to, we stop hoping, we stop living, really. I mean, I think, you know, I, I breathe and I hope, you know, uh, was it Dom Spero Spiro or Spiro Spero, <laughs> whichever it is. But, you know, it's really, really important to hope. Um, but I don't think it's that sort of positivistic hope that we might, yeah. you know, thought in the past of you know we're, we're all heading towards a utopia where everything's going to be all right and um you know and and humanity can achieve it all by itself it, I, that's not hope to my mind hope is much much more a sense of whatever circumstances we find ourselves in there is always good to be brought out of it and that that's exactly where we go back into that sort of in, sense of being entangled in the love of god that that always whatever the circumstances there is there is good to be brought to be brought in, in, in you know out, out of things um and and i think it's something that we hold emotionally um together with and this is it's really hard to do this i think but i think we do i mean i i see the first swallow arrive you know in the spring and my heart leaps for joy and instantaneously the fear comes in of the spring when we don't see the swallows arrive. Mm. And it's, it's as if my hope is always held together with, with a, a profound uh, anticipated lament, if you like. Um, and, and holding them together is, is important, but it's also really important to enjoy the joy, <laughs> if you like, of, yeah. of the swallow yeah, yeah. so that we don't, we don't, allow the lament just to pull us down into what I would call a sinful state of despair and, and negativity and a refusal of hope and joy because we can we can allow ourselves to become so self-absorbed with our negative emotions that you know we drive the grace of God out you know and I think that's that's a real danger and certainly when I've been very anxious at times and to, and depressed and I'm not saying you know I'm you know depression is real and I'm not saying it's sinful please don't think that I'm saying that but I am saying that that when we we allow ourselves to be drawn into the negative we must also hold on to the hope that is within us and 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 the joy that God gives us and the grace that is there that can bring bring us out of well who, who is there in the hidden and in, in and in the darkness and in the cloud and that's exactly why it's so important because you know depression can feel anxiety despair can feel such a cloud that hangs over us but god is there right in mm. and the grace but of i guess both, both of us have been in that um, yeah. situation where you know it, it can look it can look like despair and and, and in a really sense what we're there for we have to be there for each other therefore don't we yeah. um because yeah. um you know there will be times when we don't see the whole picture um, that's the nature of, of our limitations, isn't it? So, uh, you know, if, if, if the church is anything, surely it's that community of people that can be there for each other to hold the whole story when we can only see part of it, whether that is some kind of shiny utopian hope that doesn't quite touch reality, or um, it's, it's a, a sort of sinking sense of despair that you know, we can't see ourselves, see our way out of it. Um, so there, there's... 
it's something that we have to do together, I guess, in order to give a permission to feel what we feel. Absolutely. And, and the church has to be a place, it seems to me, that with, with you know, depending on where, how we understand the church and what our physiologies are, but, you know, the sacraments of, of grace, baptism, the Lord's Supper, are places where we can come and encounter a God of hope in Christ and Emmanuel, you know, God with us. And, and it has to be a place where we can come and be real about, you know, what we face. And, 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 uh, and I, uh, partly that's, you know, again, why I wrote the book, let's be real about where we are, because actually, you know, as someone who's got children and possibly grandchildren one of these days, you know, I really, have, really struggle with how I can, you know, keep hope alive for them. But absolutely, we, ha we have to, and we have to do it by, by going deep, going deep into the resources of God's grace, which is eternal and, you know, holds us into looking positively into the future with, with, with hope and love and faith. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess, I mean, it seems to me that there's, we, we all have to work out what hope is now because uh, it's not quite what we thought it was. You know, it isn't that um, the idea of endless progress that, you know, we've ever always had since the Enlightenment, since the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what, what, we, what are we going to suggest now, uh, for everybody is a time when um i mean some people might you know disagree with both of us actually or at least one of us on on um how we see it so and i think it's important um i don't know if you agree that we we actually yeah. do some debate about about this within the community of believers if you like about what hope yeah. means now but but also be, begin to sort of tool up about how to do lament Mm -hmm. um, it, it's being increasingly talked about these days, uh, but actually, what does it look like? I mean, I don't, I don't suppose. Have you done any laments, you know, in your church yet? In working? Church? Not, not in church, but but in the book, I do describe. Um, I think we we're at Hay Hall outside Wigan, and walking in the woods there, and just lying down on the ground, and feeling the earth sobbing. And I think I just heard about, you know, the latest about the uh, Amazon rainforests on fire, and I just. You know, I, I could, I found myself just weeping and lamenting, you know, deeply in touch with the earth and feeling the earth itself sobbing, you know, which might seem a bit strange, but, but actually it was very real and a very profound sense of, of, of a deep lament. Yeah. You know, and I think somehow we need to, to capture that or, or find ways of doing that, which is real and in a ritual holding of lament, because that's what ritual does so well. It holds us in our deepest emotions and, and helps us to mm. form them into something, you know, that we can live with. And I think, thanks. And, uh, you know, what, what I hope we can do, and I'll, I'll just post the questions that we're going to uh, offer people um, now. Um, two simple questions, because uh, we'd like um, to just to get a, I'm curious about what the hive mind here today, uh, the 100 and how many, 49 people, uh, what we make of um, how to lament, uh, what does it look like, and what does hope look like in these in these circumstances? Um, so, uh, shall we take a break there, Frankie? Um, let's do that. Thank you very much, and uh, let's hand over to everybody. Um, and I'll just take us through how we'll do that, and we'll come back afterwards for a few kind of um, ten fifteen minutes of, of wrap up. Hopefully everybody can see the, the questions in the chat there, and those will go with you into the breakout rooms, but you probably have to open the chat box to uh, recover them, to find them again. Uh, and thank you to our facilitators who will just sort of get the ball rolling. Um, and yeah, you know, we've been talking about some fairly, um, not easy things to talk about, and we, um, we won't necessarily all know each other in the breakout rooms, which can be a good thing sometimes in these circumstances. Um, so just listen sensitively, listen actively, don't, let's not interrupt, um, uh, but listen, you know, hear people through, but also give everybody a chance to say where they're coming from and where they think they might be going to, if indeed they know. I mean, you know, this is, these are not conversations we're used to having really, are they? So um, the questions are in the chat and what we'll, but what we'll do now, uh, just as you, um, we talked about contemplation. I think it's important to just to sink into 
a little bit more sense of stillness. So uh, Ruth's going to play for us um, just a little sort of visual which will help us to um, absorb what, what Frankie shared with us, what we what the thoughts that have been triggered in our minds. And, uh, and then there'll be a bit of music as well. And then when that's done, in about three or four minutes, we'll head off to our breakout room. Is that okay? So, uh, Ruth, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Do keep the comments coming, and that, but I think we, we're ready to make a, a start on this some some really rich and reflective and heartfelt contributions. Uh, and I think there may be. It seems to me there are three, at least three, sort of themes coming through. Um, 
there's some curiosity about what lament actually might mean in a public setting and um well perhaps we'll come on to that um there's there's some questions about conversion and repentance and how uh how we speak about repentance in the world that we now have and, and make that a public um movement how we make it something that is of political significance and and then thirdly uh, something that i picked up is about eschatology about the end times this consciousness of there being a kind of ending uh, but is it or is it not the kind of ending that you know we've often been taught taught about uh, like from the book of revelation so uh, there's quite a lot for us to work there with frankly i think <laughs> um and there's no doubt more that's still coming in shall we shall we make a start frankly with, with the whole question of lamentation and just that the, the sort of what it looks like how how it might work what it might be um there's a, a comment here a question really about what's the difference between lamentation yeah. and despair which i, I thought was that one too yeah. a very um yeah, does that trigger any thoughts for you? It, it does. I think they are profoundly different. Um, I, I think lament is, is actually I mean, it's ancient, ancient traditions. And someone else mentioned about how the English are not, it's not a culture, you know, that's particularly used to it. And that in the Middle East, there's a lot more of, of, of a tradition of lament. Of course, it goes way back into Greek culture and into, you know, into our, our Judeo roots as well. Um, and it seems to me that lament is actually a ritualized uh, expression of, of deep grief and loss. Um, and it's also a calling upon God. Um, David Ford has that lovely book, Christian Wisdom, where he talks about the cry of the oppressed, the cry, uh, you know, what shall I cry, says Isaiah, and picked up by John the Baptist. Um, and that sort of sense of crying out what you feel um either you know as i was sobbing in the, in the woods or or yeah. you know small group or you know or just having the space to to express that profundity of of of, of grief and despair and and just basically you know where is the hope but the cry itself is is a hopeful thing to do because you're doing something you know, that's the beginning of activism. Let's say that that's the beginning of, 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 of an active turn, which I think is so profoundly important. So I don't think it matters too much how it's done, to be honest. And, you know, and I think probably it, it needs to be real. I mean, I think there's probably nothing worse than, than it feeling like this is contrived or, you know, or something we've, we, 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 we've got to do. Um, I think it's something that comes quite naturally from the depths of the feeling. You know, that's where it be begins well there's yes and there, there's a couple of things um that have come through uh, that embroidered what you've said that um firstly that uh, that Di i think Diane said that, that it's um people have to be psychologically ready so that there's a there is a need that there's an interface here between theology and psychology isn't there and it's often mm. um i mentioned the climate psychology alliance that have been a massive inspiration to me um and it would be such a rich partnership if we could pull together something uh, amongst Christian um, uh, psychotherapists, for instance, such, such like to create, to explore what these pathways of change might be. Um, and lest we think that that's just about sort of therapy, um, a point, another point that's been made is that really this the setting for lament is in community. It's a profoundly, con shared experience and actually that there is safety in the sharing of the experience mm. then that in itself puts a lot of premium on actually doing it safely doesn't it because the last thing we, we want is <laughs> in a church that's already agonizing about safeguarding uh, <laughs> is to do something mm. that's not uh, safe for people and i guess also paul i mean one of the things that you know when when i sort of hit rock bottom it was the sense that actually other people are there too and i think that's what greta Thunberg and others really made folk 
sit up and think, okay, I'm, I'm in this alone. There are other people around. And lament is, is a way of, of sharing that profundity of, of and, and saying, you know, yeah, I'm not alone in this. And that's, that's so important because again, in our, you know, neoliberal ideological world where, you know, everything gets atomized and, and we're all turned into individualistic sort of, you know, consumers actually to come together. And this is what religion can do. It yeah. binds us together, you know, it brings us together in, in, in a sense of shared experience that is of profound ultimate, you know, significance. And it's clearly people are interested in, in putting lament out there. Um, I don't know if that, from Jacqueline if this is actually a, a something that's happening or is about to happen, but Grayson Perry is using lament um, in the, his, the, as his theme in his next series of Art Club. So, you know, if Grayson Perry can do it, then, um, you know, we, and, and yes, it is, as somebody says, it's a, it's a new expression. Uh, thanks for, to Sue for that, a new expression within the church. And yes, um, I think it will be new, but in a sense, it's nothing new, is it? Because mm. look at Jeremiah, look at the Book of Lamentation. Yeah, indeed, absolutely. And, so, and also, it has really strong links through to this, the, that part of, of, of our liturgies, um, which are about repentance and about actually saying sorry you know, for, for the wrongs we do in our personal lives, but also, you know, to the natural world and, and, and our, our corporate responsibilities. And, you know, I, in, in, in like There's No Tomorrow in the book, you know, I spent a whole chapter, I think, on Psalm 51 and on, on how, you know, um, who will praise God from the grave. There's, there, there's materials, particularly in the Psalms, you know, where we are enabled to cry out our, our anguish, um, and 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 those those psalms have got so much um, rich resource to enable us to lament and to and to say sorry, um, repent of of of, of uh, and and to express our brokenness, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. You know, and I, I think these these are are really really important resources to draw upon, particularly in a world where again you know we're our autonomy and our you know we we we're sold a sense of humanity that that doesn't allow us often to repent and to forgive and to just to be sorry i mean you know rare is the politician who mm. says sorry today yeah that's right well we'll come on to repentance because that was another thing but just before we do that i just want to um pick up on a couple of points about lament um uh, and 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 rather that this is not about sort of staying with wallowing in, in pity but actually uh, so Laura says uh, grief and lament open us up to feelings of joy and I think that's um mm. that that's exactly what you were saying earlier I guess that um mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yes we need to allow ourselves to be somewhere but we also need to look out for each other uh, and enable us each of us all of us to move to move on when we're ready uh, into whatever it is that beckons um, and um, the next comment actually from uh, Ruth is about um, courage. So we are all called yeah. to courage, which in turn encourages others. So the idea, it, it, there's something here about lament being a place of regeneration, isn't there? Um, mm. where we can move into something new. And some lovely examples there of, of, of uh, regenerative, this is, it's great that XR, for instance, is sort of, put this word, this word on the, in the dictionary, uh, examples of regenerative practice, um, you know, in communities, you know, things that we can do locally that actually are a sign of a better, uh, better world. Um, so repentance is, um, yeah, I've, uh, earlier, so as Sue said, um, she asked a question actually, so yeah, Amongst the, the, the R's, um, I, I won't remember them all now, it's re um, re resilience, restoration, re restoration <laughs> re relinquishment, rest, uh, relinquishment, uh, and reconciliation. Yeah. Reconciliation, <laughs> uh, Should we be adding repentance, uh, mm. or is that part of relinquishment? Uh, it just seems as if re repentance is taken seriously, um, if it's taken seriously, it's, it's positive as a turning away from other another way of life and yeah you know it's a gospel of repentance that's what john the baptist preached wasn't it, it was good news of repentance um and charles 
has raised um, the work, which I wasn't aware of, of Professor Mike Hume, uh, who talks about the essential role of spiritual transformation in, um, you know, if we're going to get, get through this. Um, and, and Pope Francis is laid out, so C is all about that. And it, this, this exploration of repentance reminds me of, um, you know, back in the medieval times, there was a whole upwelling of the penitential movement. You know, Francis of Assisi, for instance, created a whole movement in society which was ready for change and modeled that for the rest of society. So I wonder if that, if there's anything there you can, uh, that triggers that triggers for you? I, I, I put repentance closer to reconciliation. I mean, you know, the, the, the sacrament of reconciliation is, is, is part of some of our Christian traditions. And it seems to me that repentance is definitely a step of turning away from and recognition and truthful recognition of, 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 of a sense of guilt and a sense of wrongdoing um, in order to take that step towards and to turn around metanoia, to turn around and, and face in a different direction. And, and it seems to me, and face towards a, a sense of reconciliation with God, with others, with the world, the natural world around. And so um, I, I, I think it's a profoundly important thing to be honest enough to recognize our wrongdoing and to say sorry um, in order to feel a sense of reconciliation in, in, in the moment that enables us to have hope and have you know, have a sense of God's grace in our lives, that we are, you know, that yes, we've done wrong, but that's not the end of the story. You know, the, the death of, of, of our, of, 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 of our um, despair is, is not where we need to stay. We can move from that into a more hopeful place and be reconciled and, and, and work towards a reconciliation as well. Yeah, um, I'm not putting myself very well, but it, repentance is definitely, I think, belonging with, with um, reconciliation, which then leads us on to sense of, okay, what do I need to restore? What do I need to relinquish? You know, to go back to Bendel's, you know, um, words. So, yeah, I, it's really repentance. It, it sounds, yes, I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that we have, there are several things we have to do at once. Um, we have to, be, be transformed at many different levels at the same time and in different ways. And, uh, you know, this is what faith has always been, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a journey of transformation that works in many, in many levels and in many circumstances uh, and is, is um, uh, hugely uh, kind of flexible in the way it can be applied. And, and it seems that, yeah, there's a huge challenge there and an invitation to, to us who are a community of faith to make that, um, to, to map out what that means uh, mm. for, as, a, as, a, as a question of mission. So what is mission today, mm. if, mm. if the task mm. is just as you described? Mm. Um, in the last few minutes, shall we just have a look at the, what I thought was the, 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 the other main thing to come out, but only quietly, but it's a couple of comments about kind of end times and how, yeah. how we interpret where we are now. So uh, a while back, Daniel, uh, said there is a serious need for Christians to grapple with issues of eschatology, this um, mm -hmm. uh, school of thought that there is an ending um, and conjecture about what that ending might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, the hope of heaven and hope of Jesus just overwhelms the need to, to take responsibility now. And, you know, we can see this in the caricatures that, that come, um, often seem to be show it seemed to be seen coming across the Atlantic but I'm sure they're in this country as well you know this idea that we should just bring it on mm -hmm. um and, and and that's connected with the whole question of judgment you know we we're, we're already this is it's all coming home to roost as it were mm -hmm. and Noel says um he thinks the church has got eschatology wrong so he's, he's searching for a theology of, of the earth in which we acknowledge that actually the planet will die one day you know and you know but i think I, as, a, as a kid i can remember thinking well you know sooner or later the meteorite will hit us or something um 
So, you know, how do we how do we do eschatology? How do we do end times now? How how on earth do we make sense of all that body of literature that's in the back of the Bible um, today? Uh, I mean, I'm not someone who believes that you know, bring on the apocalypse, and you know, this is the second coming of Christ when everything goes up in Armageddon. That's not how I would understand God to work. Um, but I do think that we're not promised a happy ending necessarily. I mean, you know, I think that there's a sense in which um, how we might well be living, you know, in end times and the end might not, is, is in God's hands. Who knows? This planet will not last forever. You know, nothing lasts forever. But we also have a sense in which uh, we're shown revealed um, a God who sends his son who is resurrected and proving that that death is not the final word and so i think that brings us back into a sense of of the present moment containing the eschaton that you know the, the end is is already with us um, through the deep waters of death we are baptized you know there's a sense in which death is in, in in the midst of life we are also in death in the midst of death we are also in life and and I, I, I remember I've talked a correspondence with Rowan Williams about this and, and, and just saying, you know, expressing to him exactly this question, you know, where are we? And he came back with that wonderful, um, that wonderful phenomenon that he wrote about when he wrote Writing the Dust, that little tiny book that he produced just after 9-11. When, and he, he reminded me that, that actually as people were plummeting to their death or going to their death in the air, they were sending text messages to loved ones. And he said, even though death was imminent, there were, there were absolute moments of grace and mercy that were of ultimate value in those messages. Of and it seemed to me that there, there was something incredibly important in what he was saying about, about the grace of the present moment containing it's a momentous moment if you like it's a moment that is that contains both life and death now and what we're called to do is realize or realize our response to the grace of God through turning again towards the good and towards the love and towards the grace that is there held um, in every moment of every 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 of, of you know of every moment of every day and that that if we start from there, from that moment of grace, and from that grace, um, absolutely, I mean, it goes back to the cloud of unknowing, where where the writer talks about beating on the cloud, and it that it is betwixt God and and me, and 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 allowing God's grace to break through. And I think that that's when we do that, we we are enabled to live the next moment in hope. The mm. next moment Thank you. Yeah. God. Thank, thank you. Uh, that seems to be a, just the perfect place to bring this to an end. Um, we could go on for so long, but uh, time is ticking on. Um, I really want to say thank you um, yet again to, to, to you, Frankie, because uh, you've opened up, uh, opened doors uh, for me, and I think clearly for a lot of people this morning. Uh, it's been which such a privilege, Paul. We want to we want to keep open, we want to keep our feet in those doors. <laughs> um, and one of the ways that Green Christian is, is doing that is through our um, emerging project called Borrowed Time. We're hoping next year, early next year, to, uh, to, to really provide something that offers churches ways to, to, to engage with all of the questions that we've been talking about through partic two particular practical things. Uh, one is to uh, design and help people, help churches uh, create circles where these kinds of conversations, uh, heartfelt, honest, uh, safe conversations can be had, uh, which empower and um, liberate action. Uh, and equally, um, experiences and commu well, communal experiences, as we've uh, heard, from our, from our commentators today, of lament. Uh, what does it mean to, to lament in public today? And how can we, what can we draw from our tradition um, and the deeper uh, Hebrew tradition of uh, lamentation for uh, unfamiliar times? So uh, 
it, we've we've delved deep. I think this morning uh, it's been it's taken some courage from everybody to go there, and I I, I really um, salute everybody for that, and and thank you, thank you for all the, the very wise and uh, generous contributions in the chat to everybody. Sorry, we haven't been able to address everything. Um, we will be looking to the next step this afternoon with in the program with how to. Um, to sort of to realise the hope that emerges from the uh, that, that symbiosis of hope and lamentation. So um, we're not going to leave you hanging. Um, but anything else from you, Frankie, or shall we? Um, no, I, I just like to come back to that word courage. And courage, you know, comes from the Latin to have heart. And I think that that's that's a really really good place for us all to finish. Is that we need to have heart, and have heart that is full of full of God's grace, full of love, full of hope. And, and then, you know, who knows what, what lies ahead, but at least we will be as fully human as we can be as we face into it. And, you know, have heart. Let's have courage. Indeed. Let's do that. So um, thank you very much. And let me, on behalf of everybody, and it's a shame that we can't hear rounds of applause uh, on Zoom. It always seems to be the biggest shortcoming in Zoom, but I'm sure that the, it's rippling around the country now. So thank you very much. To, uh, to Frankie, and um, I'm sure everybody's going to rush out now and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so um, over to the team. I think our, our job is done. But thank you very much, Frankie. And we'll see you. Thank you.